Um, I love the Psalms, and um, one of the things about the Psalms is that um, if, if you read the Psalms and you actually see a piece of this um, even this morning, but the Psalms always engage us in our stories, our past stories, our current stories, and they look toward uh, the future. But one of the things the Psalms do, um, a lot like the parables of Jesus, is they take the experience of whoever's writing the song, and it becomes part of, part of what they think through. And so they'll, they'll use ordinary things in life or ordinary occurrences. So in this particular song, there's a mention of a watchman uh, because the song just engages a current function of what the psalmist was thinking about in, in everyday life. And I think the psalms do that for us. They give words to our everyday experiences. They give words to our longings in our past. They give words to the places that our hearts are broke. They give words to the places where our hearts sing. Um, but their song for the broken, their song uh, for, for the joyous, and all of these are captured by psalms, which is poetry. It's what poetry does. It grabs um, the heart and ways that other narratives do not. St. Augustine, he's a man that lived a long time ago, um, as he was getting older and coming nearer to death, it is said that he asked for the psalms to be plastered all over the room in which he was laying. And the psalm actually in particular was one in which um, um, was, was put up in his room so that on his deathbed, the psalms have imagination. They imagine where um, imagination is then steeped and put into speech. And it is said that Augustine at the end of his life, his whole God, the ordinariness of life. Songs radio right now. The intent of the song writer, the singer, they are trying to speak that are ordinary life. The nature. Oh, and we even have songs. This is my father's world. I hear him pass in the rustling. voice comes out. For me, uh, that my heart's always Again. So Psalm 130 that was used in worship. Begins kind of in a really solemn place and then it ascends in the praise. It goes from lament uh, to praise. And so we're going to read it out of the depths. I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my prayer. 
for you, O Lord, would still be the standing, but there's the gospel but. But with you, there is forgiveness. That you may be feared. I, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for the Lord. And in his word, I hope My soul waits for the Lord. It waits more than even the watchman for the morning. If you don't get that, I'm going to say it again. It waits even more than a watchman waits for the morning. Oh, people of God, Israel, that's who we are. Oh, people of God, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord, there is an un, uh, there's a steadfast, unfailing, never-ending love. And with Him is redemption that can't be stopped. It's abundant and it's plentiful. And He will redeem His people from all. Of their sin. That's one well whale of a song. <laughs> it's one hell of a song. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We're gonna walk through it and just take a moment in the middle for a little discourse. Um, it's not a long song, um, but uh, I, I want to just go through it. One of the things we find out, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. The, 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 the song, you know what the songwriter knows here? Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. There is an assumption here from the songwriter that the Lord God is in the depths with him that no matter how buried and how far away or how steeped and how deep he is when he calls out he expects god to be right there with him when he is in the depths god is present in the deep god is present in the darkness god is present in the brokenness the psalmist recognizes that and he cries out, expecting, as he says, in the depths, O oh Lord, even while I am here in the deepest, darkest place I can imagine, I am praying to the one that I expect to hear my voice, even here. Not just when I'm on the mountaintop, not just when I'm doing well, but God is in the hole. <laughs> God is in the depths. God is in the place, the very place where you're crying for help and you're crying for mercy. He is there. And he hears. The Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. One of the things, well, why is the psalmist in the depths? And I, I think it's beautiful that he doesn't uh, tell us in, in a sense why, but we actually know a little bit more of the story of what brought him into these depths, what has brought him in this place to cry for his own, to cry for help, to cry for God. We, we, we know in this particular psalm, he is in this place not because something or someone has done something to him. 
It's not because someone did something to him. He or she is here in the depths because they've put themselves by their own decisions in this place. They're here because it's self-inflicted. They're here because of the choices they've made. They're here because they've chosen to walk away from God. We, we know that from the next verse because they're pleading for mercy. They're in a place, and we're in a place where we need mercy. We're, we're not asking God to come and take something bad away from us that has happened to us, that has put us in this place of brokenness. We're not asking God for that. We're asking God in this place of death for mercy because we need mercy. So he says, if you, O Lord, would mark iniquities, you know what? And it's so thankful. <laughs> Even as you read this, you, you can get for what did he do or she do? Well, what, did, what did they do? What sin did they do that put them in this depth? You know what? If, if the psalmist had mentioned the specific sin, we would turn this into a holy legalistic psalm <laughs> because it would become about that particular sin. Instead, the psalmist said, if you mark anything that we've ever done, any iniquity we've ever done, who can stand? I am thankful, God, that you are not a God that keeps score. And I am going to claim that promise in the midst of my place in the, in the depths here. There's a subtle twist here, and I'm going to, this will be my little discourse that I'm going to go off to in a, in, a, in a minute, even as we gather around the table. But you hear what the psalmist does? The psalmist actually just says, if the Lord marked iniquity, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. I've got myself here. I have put myself here. So I am not going to focus on me. I'm going to focus on God. The psalmist is saying, let's not focus on the one who got themselves into the mess about how they're going to get themselves out of the mess. Let's focus on the one who doesn't keep score. And let's focus on the one with whom there is forgiveness. Literally, in the Hebrew, this means, oh Lord, who could stand but with you, you have the habitual habit of forgiveness. That you be feared. And so he turns his focus on the character of God who forgives. And his comfort comes in the God whose habit is forgiveness. Forgiveness is a great thing. We are called to confess. I think one of the great things about confession with Matt, if you know, we don't come to confession to beat ourselves up here. You know why we come to confession even as we go through and I'm going to take us to Christ and all because we know we've already been forgiven. <laughs> because we have a God whose habit is forgiveness. So, con confession isn't this awful thing. One, we're confessing what he already knows. And two, we have the freedom to confess without fear. Because he's already forgiven us. interesting because the psalmist is on the other side of the cross and I'm going to end with the waiting thing that I am going to just spend a moment regarding confession because we're at the table today 
and even as we engage this song, I find, and, and certainly as in, in the world I grew up in, as we came to the, the table, when they would announce the table the week before, we did it four times a year, and the reason they announced it the week before is so that you could pray all week long and confess all week long to prepare yourself for the table. With confession. And so I would come to the table and it, it, would, it would be this experience. If I were writing um, the psalm, it, it may look like this. And so, you know, and, and you come to the table and the table says, well, you know what? You can eat and drink judgment upon yourself. And, and if you haven't confessed, you're going to eat and drink judgment on myself. And I would come to this table scared and I would come to the table fearful. And sometimes I, I wouldn't even come to the table because I wasn't sure I was I had confessed, or I wasn't really sure I was sorry enough because I actually did repent of that one thing, but you know what? I did it again. There ain't a person in the room who hasn't done that. When we look at confession that way, and I'm, I'm going to do some reading here a little more than I don't because I, I, I just wanted to focus on kind of where my heart and our heart is. But we can take this confession with the God whose habit is forgiveness. And in that view of confession, in that view even of the table, as I got the, 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 the note in the bulletin the week before because there was no email back then, and I certainly couldn't get a text. The central character of my story that week was me. See, we've taken confession, and confession is where we become the central character, and God doesn't. You know, God will forgive me if it depends on, um, depending on how good and sincere my confession is. Did I say it right? Did I mean it? And boy, I would spend those weeks working really, really hard for feeling really, really bad for what I did and what I've done so that I could really, really repent. And then I'd do it again, and then I'd have to repent of my insincerity because I did it again. Am I sorry enough? I mean, here's the one where we use this with each other. Am I sorry enough? Am I really sorry? Or am I sorry because I got caught? Right? Everyone's heard that. Are you really sorry? Or are you sorry? I don't know. I've been caught. I don't know if I'm really, really sorry. I don't know if I'm sorry because I got caught. Such questions are not only wrong-headed, but to demand an answer to them from ourselves or others will always drive you and I to question our repentance. We question its sincerity, and we question ultimately whether God has really forgiven us in Christ. Martin Luther was so preoccupied with his own forgiveness, he wrote this. With the, he was so preoccupied with how sorry he was with his own sorrow, he actually became deaf to forgiveness. Have we become deaf to forgiveness because we're worried about how really sorry we are? We must, Luther insisted, turn attention away from ourselves, our sorrow, our regret, our confession, and our repentance with ears only attuned to the Father's forgiveness. 
Luther said he was so focused upon himself and how sorry and how truly repentant was he was, he never got to see the glad heart of the Father. Luther said this, the quest for perfect repentance is a foolish pursuit, driving us back to ourselves and not, and not to Christ. You see, our forgiveness does not originate from our repentance. Our forgiveness originates from Christ. Do you see the subtle twist, the evil one? If there is one thing you remember today is that your forgiveness does not originate from your repentance. It only originates from the forgiver. Should you and I repent of the wrong we have done, of course, of course. Should we repent of the sin we thought we had conquered but we're still secretly in love with? Of course, of course. But know this. You will never repent enough. And I will never repent enough. You and I will never repent sincerely enough. But our forgiveness is not based upon having enough repentance or having sufficiently sincere repentance. Our forgiveness is based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ Period. Yes, thank you, Jesus. It is based on the finished work of Christ. Period. His atonement. It's not my substitutionary atonement of feeling sorry for myself or feeling sorry that I did it. It's His substitution. It's His finished work. His cross is enough because his sacrifice was perfectly sincere. It was perfectly sincere. His blood not only covers the blood, his blood not only covers the sin of which I have done, but his blood actually covers my imperfect repentance. That's how great His blood is. I wait for the Lord, but with you, verse 4, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits in His word, I hope. That word there, it says, I, 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 but with you, Lord, there's forgiveness and you are to be feared. And it's such a multitasking thing, but you're to be trusted. You're, you're the one who forgives. You are to be feared. You are the one um, that forgives. You're the one, but with you, there is forgiveness. You are the one then that's to be worshiped. You're the one. It's you. It's Jesus plus nothing is everything. I think there also is in a sense because it says, you know, who can mark the iniquities? Um, um, who can mark, if you counted, if you counted or kept score, who could stand? But, but with you, there is forgiveness that you be feared. And then it goes into this. And so I actually think that there's this trust involved in this fear. There, there's this trust that for the psalmist was, was maybe a hope because he says, I wait for the Lord. Well, what is he waiting for? You know, it seems like it shifts gears here, and it's like, well, what are you, you're waiting, and you're, you, if you read the rest, like I read it, it's like, man, my soul, my soul's agonizing and waiting for the Lord. What is the, what is he waiting for? He's, he's kind of already proclaimed 
forgiveness of sins. He's, he's probably said that God's the habit of, in the habit of forgiveness and he's to be worshiped and he's to be feared. What, what is it that he is waiting for? And, and I think there is a sense, even in the psalmist, on that side of the cross, that he knew that with you is there, but with you there is forgiveness. But if there's a sense of fear, it's the fear that God would remove his forgiveness, that my soul is longing for the day where that forgiveness is final. My hope is for the day that forgiveness is final. My hope is for the day that it's not in the blood of bulls and goats, which could never take away my sin, but it is in something greater than that. It is something that's more hopeful than that. I am waiting for the Lord. And there's a sense that I know that if he doesn't come, that if he is not in the habit of forgiveness, I'm done. And so I wait. I wait for the Lord. And then it says, and in his word, I hope. And I want you to hold on to that. And to his word, I hope. Right now, he's trusting. So right now, he's trusting in the, into your promises, I hope. I am hoping in your promises that when I go to the temple and I offer my sacrifice, that there truly is forgiveness of sins into something that's being promised. I am going, my soul waits. And in your promises, I hope. I hope in your promises. You can go to the next slide. My soul waits for the Lord more the watchman in the morning. You know, the watchmen in those days, they, you know, they probably had, if you've seen old movies, they're on these, usually castles were built up on a hill. The hill was part of their defense. The watchmen would like, but the watchman's job was really tenuous every night because once it got dark, you couldn't see anything. And you would be on watch. And you know what? If someone was really sneaky and stayed on the ground, um, you know, there's always a threat of attack under the night skies because no matter how good a watchman is, um, um, the watchman can't wait for dawn because it's light and he could see. Our, the, the psalmist is saying, my, my soul is waiting in this darkness, maybe the literal, literal darkness, but I'm waiting for the Lord. Remember, um, more than watching them, oh Israel, hope in the Lord. Remember verse five, it said hope in the word. Now we get that explained. Oh Israel, hope. Who's the word? What is the word? Hope in the Lord. The word is not an abstract idea. Here we find the hope is in a person. It's in a person. And that person is the one to which he is hoping as he longs for. And we know from the book of John that the word is the Lord. Because, O oh Lord, for with the arrival of the Lord, there is steadfast love and plentiful redemption. With the arrival of Jesus, the word, our hope, is unfailing love. Jesus is God's word walking around. Jesus is forgiveness walking around. Jesus is the Prince of Peace walking around in the flesh. And with that arrival comes this unfailing, unstoppable, never-ending love with plentiful redemption that covers all of God's people. O oh, Israel, all of God's people, hope in the Lord. And he will redeem all of God's people from all of their iniquities. We come to this table. Because this is what the psalmist was waiting for. He was waiting for Jesus. And when Jesus came, the Word came, and there was the unfailing and steadfast love. There was plentiful redemption, and the waiting ended. Now our soul waits for the return and the final conclusion of this. I, I love the one song, sometimes they're sung at communion. There is a fountain filled with blood. There's a line in that psalm that says this, and it just it makes me weep every time I sing it or hear it. 
that we've been, we will be saved to sin no more. I long for that day as a watchman. who waits in the morning. This is one of Luther's favorite psalms. He said the gospel is so succinct in the psalm, and it is. As we come to the table, we are reminded, if the Lord marked your sins, who could come to the table? No one. No one. But God is in the habit of forgiveness. And we take this table to remind ourselves of that. You know why God also is in the habit of forgiveness? Because it's the only thing that can transform your and I's life. It's why the enemy tries to get us even to think confessions all about ourselves. There's a story in the Bible where a woman anoints Jesus' feet and he he ties forgiveness directly to love. He who's been forgiven much loves much. The devil wants to attack the great commands of loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbor as ourself, all he has to do is go after our confession and our forgiveness. And if he gets our forgiveness, he's got our love for others. This table, the broken body, and the shed blood of the Lord reminds us that God is in the habit of forgiveness because with God there is the forgiveness of sins until he comes our soul waits our soul waits on the Lord we trust the promises of God that he will come again that one day there will be no more sickness no more sorrowing no more weeping there will be no more sin we trust his word for that our soul as we come to this table waits for the Lord it waits for the one who is the word our soul as it come waits and longs and engages the one who is full of steadfast unfailing unstoppable love our soul as we come to this table comes to the one who in his habit of forgiveness offers plentiful plentiful and abundant redemption. Our soul comes as it waits as we come to this table as ones knowing that he will redeem his people from all of our sins. Period.